Alyssa and Melissa. Oh my goodness, med students. So there's med students here, currently. All right. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for coming to the Informatics Discovery Lab lecture here at the Department of Medical Informatics and Clinical Epidemiology. As you know, we stream these live. And so if you're listening live, you can send a tweet to at OHSU Informatics, and uh, someone will be monitoring it, and we can take your questions there. And I have to remind you that as well, since we are doing this live, that if you will hold down the little buttons uh, on the little sp uh, speakers near your seat, if you ask a question, um, then we will see you. And of course, I lost my notes. So I'm Dave Dorr. Um, I, it's, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Radeski, um, who is an assistant professor in emergency medicine at the, at the University of Texas at Houston, um, who uh, comes to us to, uh, to uh, is our guest today um, uh, to talk to us about some informatics work he's been doing uh, actually with Dean Siddig as an HRQ uh, fellow very recently. Um, and <laughs> I have some additional information here. So he, he actually uh, was interested in this early on. He attended Stanford, and he got a degree uh, related to this. Um, I, hopefully I'll get this right, symbolic systems uh, with some, some work in HCI, right, mm -hmm. human-computer interaction work. And then he attended the Ohio State uh, University and then ended up doing his uh, emergency medicine. Uh, for, so we're very interested to hear about topological <laughs> data analysis, about which I know very little. So uh, I, I'll turn it over to Dr. Rodeski. All right. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you all for having me. Um, I, that is correct. I am going to introduce you to topological data analysis, which is not necessarily a new field, but it is sort of a field that is emerging in its use, at least in the health sciences. Um, starting out, I have no disclosures or support or conflicts of interest to declare although that you may find that interesting because I basically focus on the, the outputs of one specific product by one specific company the entire time, but they are not paying me and I don't have any relationship with them. Um, and uh, so basically the, the quick agenda, the overview is going to be what is topological data analysis? Um, it's a little bit different than other statistical techniques and other ways of approaching data. Um, so we're just going to go into a brief overview of that. And then mostly what the talk's going to be is a lot of uh, examples of its use in uh, biological and clinical applications. Um, and then at the end, if there is time and people have not fallen asleep and they are interested, I can fire up the uh, IAS, the IRIS platform, and we can see some examples of how you kind of go about sort of exploring the data and the real simple data set that I have essentially lying around. Um, and at any point, if you have a question, of course, interrupt me. I generally talk fast, and then when I get nervous and I stand in front of an audience, I talk even faster. And so it's a great way to slow me down <laughs> and bring me back to reality as opposed to just blitzing through an hour's worth of slides in 20 minutes. So, uh, so don't, don't feel shy about interrupting me or asking for clarification if I have gone through a slide way too quickly because some of this stuff is a little bit odd. Um, so one way to talk about what uh, topological data analysis is is to sort of start with what it is not. Um, there's sort of a substantial overlap with a couple different areas and other areas of mathematics, um, but the application differs just a little bit from each. Um, it is not graph theoretic network topology, which is you know, one approach to visualizing the interconnectedness between relationships underlying a data set. Um, it's similar to TDA, in which the shape of a network has value. The, the, the collections of vertices have a specific relationship. Their relocation in the network uh, you know, encodes some representation, some meaning. Um, but the graphs and graphs theories are built and designed to describe processes and relationships, and they're not really for exploring uh, or, develop, or interacting with data in an exploratory fashion. Um, clustering um, overlaps some of the principles of topological data analysis. It describes some methods for grouping similar members within a data set, which is part of the way that you go, pro you go about topological data analysis, and it uses a variety of statistical, similar statistical tools. Um, but the key difference between topological analysis and clustering is that the clustering methods produce, try and produce distinct, unrelated groups, whereas uh, topological analysis is all about finding, is, uh, is relating groups to each other, and it specifically can obscure relationships between uh, different parts of the data. And then topological mapping 
it shares the word topological, but it has nothing to do with <laughs> nothing to do with topological data analysis. But it is a spatial representation of data. But it's where that. But in topologic in topographic mapping, the sort of the the specific the coordinate the, the coordinate locations and the relative locations to each other in sort of the, whatever mapping plane have a sp they, they encodes information into that. Whereas in topological analysis, the actual location you show it in a graph doesn't actually encode any specific information. It's all about the relationships in the data, not the location like on a map. Where a map, where the two-dimensional coordinate or the three-dimensional coordinate system encodes some sort of information or meaning. So, like I said, I'm talking fast. Slow me down if you need to. <laughs> um, so, like I said, topological data analysis. It's about. It's specifically concerned about building a shape out of the data. So the data. The goal is to infer high-dimensional structure from low. These from essentially from from a low-dimensional representation by assembling all these discrete points into a global structure. And these techniques are specifically designed to evaluate large quantities of heterogeneous scientific data with relationships that don't lend themselves well to traditional methods of scientific inquiry, like multivariate linear linear techniques or the clustering techniques or uh, like uh, uh, like project like some of the uh, some of the other like eigenvalues type projection type methods of, of data analysis um, there are several different techniques and several different visual visualization tools there's implementations for R you can use uh, there's implementations for MATLAB there's stuff in Java and Python uh, but what mostly I'll be showing you is representations from IOSD's proprietary uh, tool which is called IRIS and for no specific reason other than it's the most accessible tool for clinicians to use and doesn't require any specific statistical background, which is great because I have never taken a statistics course in my entire life. So it's, it's interesting that I am up here talking about all these different statistical techniques and trying to explain the difference between graph network theory and so on and so forth. But uh, so what it is, it's, it's an accessible tool for people who are not necessarily, who don't have a foundational uh, experience with, uh, with statistics to sort of get into exploring large data sets. Um, but like it's not just a single tool or a single algorithm. It's essentially a framework um, for visualization of mathematical outputs. It's a combination of different functions functions that you overlay on top of the data that distributes the different that distributes your information into a sort of a topological space and finds groupings throughout these common functions. Um, even though it can use even though it can use essentially any mathematical function as your, your sort of your lens or your filter for process pre-processing the data. What seems to work best are Euclidean functions on uh, regarding the, the distribution of data and the, cent the centralness of data sets. Um, and then finally, topological data analysis, it's kind of geared towards the buzzword, the big buzzword of big data, where you have a mess of you know, heterogeneous clinical data or genomic data that doesn't just, that's just overwhelms traditional approaches to this sort of analysis. Um, IOSD, uh, like I said, I don't work for them. You'll see their name up here a lot, but they are and if you haven't heard of them already, you probably will be hearing of them. They are the most innovative company in big data, according to Fast Company magazine. Um, so I just have, a, I have an academic sort of relationship with them where they, I got, they gave me access to this tool in exchange for, I'm not sure what, they got, what I got out of it other than, what they got out of it other than giving me access to the tool. But I guess I was, supposedly I was supposed to go back and be a champion for their product. And I guess it kind of technically worked because I'm up here talking about it. <laughs> But uh, so the basis of topological data analysis. Um, so nodes is the sort of the common language of topological data analysis. Nodes are a group of similar objects or in your data set. So this means from your data set, you'll define some measure of similarity, you know, some sort of a distance measure or a variation measure or a distance from the center sort of measure, and choose how many nodes to create. And then whatever software you're using will essentially group members into clusters based on those similarity. And this is how it kind of differentiates from clustering methods, is you can decide how many nodes a member of your data set can be included into. So that's really the key that, get, that generates, the, that's the key element of topological data analysis that generates the associations, is that each member can be a part of more than one node, as opposed to clustering where you just make it, everything is, every element belongs to a single cluster, whereas in topological data analysis, most, that you try and make it so that, that different elements from your data set belong to more than one node. And then you connect the nodes based on, you know, every, every node that has a, a certain element in it is connected to all the other nodes that have that element in it, because it's, and those are called edges. And so you end up with nodes connected by edges, and that, 
essentially connects all the similar things together in a network of this sort of associative network. And the associative network gen generates a shape, and the concept is that topological data analysis, the shape encodes the meaning. So you have, you take the nodes, you put members into the nodes, and then the way it connects and how they connect to each other and all the different features of the network, when it makes a shape in space, and we'll see lots and lots of examples of how this works, and hopefully it'll become more clear than I am describing it, um, <coughs> will encode some meaning. And then colors, uh, when you see the networks with colors, you'll see that they'll, the color, you basically color the map based on the features that, of interest. So if you have a data set with a whole bunch of dimensions and you want to see the, you know, where the areas of, the, of your network that have the highest instance of a certain, certain feature, then you color the, color the network based on that feature or whatever the values of that feature is, and those nodes will sort of highlight. Um, so using the language that IASA uses, the process starts by choosing what you call a lens. Um, essentially, this is a filter function. It's sort of a mathematical pre-processing um, that describes the fundamental, fundamental nature of, of a data point. And it's sort of the initial step in dimension reduction. Um, so describing the relationship of your data point to other uh, data points in space. And like I said before, the sort of the filter functions that are built into the IASD tool are measures of local density or measures of central tendency or... Um, and or measures of, of variance, essentially. And then you take the nodes that you've created based on similarity, and then you can see how the, when you start connecting the edges, you start generating a shape out of it, rather than just one, and it's just, it, it, so it's, but, and, so when, once, yeah. So you connect the nodes, and it stretches out into a shape of sorts, based on the edges and the structure, and, the, and, the, and by connecting the, page, the by connecting the, the like elements from each node. Um, and this is sort of another practical example that they've put together, that if you can imagine the human hand as a three-dimensional point cloud represented in original, in like utility in space, your original cloud looks like you see in figure A. And you might be able to imagine a sort of a filter function that looks at the hand and essentially encodes a little piece of data for each point based on the distance from the wrist. And so you've got the points in blue, the sort of the hand in blue is the closest to the wrist and the points in red are the furthest from the list. And then if you, um, then if you sort of create bins on those filter values for the ones that are, that, that are most similar in space. So each finger, had the, each point in the finger is most similar to the other points on that same finger. So if you bin them, based on, bin them based on similarity in space and then filter them based on distance from the hand, you can see sort of it looks like C. You can sort of say based on distance from the hand, you have the, the, sort of the six layers from the distance from the wrist. If you, and then if you also have a similarity function running, each set of points in the cloud associate with the ones in their same finger. And, then at the, and that kind of combines to making a set of nodes that actually turns out to resemble a hand. Does that seem to make sense? Okay, great. I don't, that must sound smarter than I, I think I sound. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's a little bit of a practical example that kind of brings out the difference between topological data analysis and the other approaches. This is a 1,092 individuals from the Thousand Genomes Project. Um, this data set, this is not my work, this is other people's work, this data set's 3.6 million single nucleotide polymorphisms um, identified in the sequencing project. And this is a projection that uses principal component analysis, which is sort of a measure of the, the variance between the, between the points in space. The red dots are the folks with East Asian ancestry. And you can see that if you make a projection using PCA, you don't really see the East Asian ancestry folks are scattered throughout this, the projection that they made. But you would expect if East Asian ancestry is a, you know, is a common thing and this, the single nucleotide polymorphisms should be the same throughout East Asian ancestry. So if you're really trying to do your, if you should, we would expect the data set, to, the, East, the red dots to cluster more or be more associated in space, which you don't see with a, with a PCA component analysis. If you do a clustering sort of algorithm on it, which you can kind of see at the top, um, it does a better job of finding the similarities between the folks who have East Asian ancestry based on their SNP pairs 
but it still doesn't associate them all with each other. It's, it finds five or six discrete little clusters of East Asian ancestry, which may be intuitively true to some extent, but they should be at least connect, interconnected in some fashion. So even if there are, you know, which there probably are, multiple different types of East Asian ancestry, which we obviously know there are, and they each have their own sort of pattern of single nuclear polymorphisms, they should be more like each other in some, in some, related, to some way, related to each other in some way rather than discreetly separated out in sort of a clustering thing like this. And so what it looks like when you do a topological projection of this is that your East Asian ancestry, the nodes sort of, the nodes cluster in space. They are all associated with each other in space. And they're in a distinct feature apart from the rest of the, the, rest of the folks in the, the different single nucleide polymorphisms distributed throughout space. So in, in this one, the red nodes are the nodes that have, they have been together essentially, the rows in this database who have the highest frequency of East Asian ancestry. And you can see, that essentially, it's, it's almost like you say, if you took those clusters from the previous, one, previous slide, and you connected those clusters specifically, and then everybody else who connected the clusters they were most similar to, and most similar to, and so on and so forth, and then you have, you end up with East, you end up with, you end up with essentially an insight that's coming from the shape of the network, and the, and where the and where, and, and where the where these nodes end up falling in your your data analysis network. Um, so one example of what you can do with this group is, you, know, you can select all the patients in this group, and then because this is a it's a, it's a single nuclear, it's a SNP database essentially. You can look and see what, um, what the relative frequency of the different nucleotides are within that, that group of nodes you have. And one of the ones that pops out when you take a, these are a, you know, all the chromosomes essentially from 1 through 22. You can look and see which, which uh, SNPs are most frequently expressed in that East Asian ancestry group. And the one that comes out with the highest sort of relative instance compared to the other ones is this RS2, whatever it is. 2994008, which is associated with the gastric cancer that's diffuse type gastric cancer that's a, that's a, has a higher prevalence in East Asian population. So this is not a novel insight necessarily because this was not something that was known before they made these charts, but it's a, or these graphs, but it's an, it's an example of how if you had made this graph and you had found that East Asian ancestry and you had run it through this, you would have found this, this is an this is, you know, would have, this is what exploring the data would have led you to see this association and then you could have gone back and, and, and explore this hypothesis further. Um, here's another example of population data. This is 313 samples from individuals regarding gene copy number variation. Um, they built a network off of it and filtered it for differences in gene copy variation. And if, essentially, it naturally separated itself into regions based on their common ancestry. So you had a, a most people with gene copy variations from Africa landed in one network, and European in another, and East Asian in another network. Um, and what's interesting with this, you can then color the network based on uh, specific gene variations seen most frequently in the African population. And you can find out, you know, this, sort of the this, this singleton group, these are the ones who weren't similar to anybody else when they did their first run through. And you can sort of, you can basically sort of see if there's, you can basically, uh, you, can, you can almost, uh, you can identify the singletons based on the copy, the copy number variation that's most frequently seen. You can sort of, if you're not sure which of the three ancestries they, share, they have most, most in common, now you, now you can kind of figure out which singleton, where, where that singleton is from. Um, and you can see that some people from Europe have some overlap with the African ancestry, and almost nobody in East Asia has any overlap with the African ancestry. And then one example of sort of the shape, um, you can see East Asia, the East Asian ancestry group they used here, it's sort of a flat planner, it's just a, it's a grid network almost essentially. Each, each node in the East Asian network, they have all the same copy variation, but they're not that similar to one another. They kind of spread out. Whereas in the African network, you can see they almost have a starburst pattern. They have like a, there's like a single node surrounded by little daughter nodes. And what happens, it, what actually they found out or they noticed when they went through this data set and tried to figure out why it was making those different shapes is it turned out it was all mother-child pairs. So the East Asian data set they got, all, they were all similar to each other because they had the same, had similar ancestry, but they were all different from each other. The African ancestry, it ended up being like they had a couple, just a couple families worth of data, basically. And so they had a, the same number of data points, but they were, all, they were all closely related. And so it kind of settled into this star pat, starburst pattern. And so that's one of the ways you can sort of see that there's a, something, so, so there's an insight inside the, inside the shape of the data that's different than just, uh, than just what you would otherwise expect. <clears throat> 
Um, does anybody have any idea what, I guess, I'm trying to see if it says up there anyways. Oh, it kind of does. Does anybody have an idea what this might be? What network this is? You're using it right now. It's the human brain. So there's a publicly available data set of uh, protein expression levels for the human brain that's, that you can download. And somebody created a topological projection of the human brain. And it actually kind of looks like the human brain. Um, the cells are different enough and distributed enough with different functions and different gene levels of expression that it ran, based on the filter functions they use and the way they, the way they sort it, they may have tried to make it look kind of like a human brain because you can make these networks look almost like almost anything. Um, but it kind of looks like the human brain. It even has the brain stem down at the point of reference. And what they did is they, what the, it's, this is sort of an example of, um, like I said, this is, the, this is a protein level expression for different parts of the human brain. And what, what the top is, on the left you have the hippocampus is highlighted in red. So those are the cells that were just labeled as the hippocampus in the data set. And the, sort of the part on the right it's basically the, uh, the Salvador, it's, it's the cells expressing the highest levels of this, what's called the SWH signaling pathway, the Salvador Warts hippo signaling pathway, which is involved in creating memories. And so, so coincidentally, which is not a novel insight, but this is an example of how when you sort of, when you start exploring the data and, and, and sort of visualize these relationships, you can see that if you, you know, this, it correctly identifies essentially the cells that light up as the hippocampus labels also light up with the same level, also light up with the levels of activity that are associated with the things that we know go on in the hippocampus. And the same thing with the cerebral cortex. So the cerebral cortex is uh, highlighted here in this one. And then on the right, you sort of see the levels of the MHC class 1 protein, or uh, complex assembly process. And the MHC class 1 complex also has activity in the hippocampus as well as the rest of the cerebral cortex. And it's also, uh, and that's a, a cellular thing that's involved in neuronal plasticity. It's also partly related to creating memories, and it's also related to uh, you know, uh, re functional remodeling of the brain. And you can see how, and it's interesting to see where, where in the brain these are located. So these are, those are not novel insights. But uh, so in the brain stem, same sort of thing. This is uh, another author just going through essentially all different parts of the brain and, and tr looking for associations for highlighting, uh, highlighting uh, gene level activity. Um, this is a cyst cysteine type endopeptidase activity. Um, it's the, the, the author wasn't really, and I don't, I'm not a neuro, neurologist, so I don't know what the clinical significance of that is because it's a, it's a pathway involved in apoptosis and, the, and cell death, which seems to have a higher incidence sort of in that brainstem as opposed to the rest of the brain. And I'm not sure why the brainstem would have problems with cell death. Um, but the Pudamen here, this is a, sort of the, one of the motor, motor centers of the brain. Um, what you see is highlighting here is, uh, um, and you know, that since the putamen is involved in some of the neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease, and one of the, and on the right, essentially one of the things that it notices is that the, um, the parts of the brain that are involved with uh, triglyceride synthesis uh, also light up in the sections of the brain that are involved with um, neurodegenerative diseases. And it's interesting to see if you, if you could. Uh, it's, 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 it's well known that, the, that uh, impair, impaired cholesterol synthesis in these, these portions of the brain are part of the disease process that's involved with Parkinson's and the other movement disorders. So it's, it's, interesting, it's interesting to see the way these things correlate specifically with their representations in space, um, even when you make something that looks almost uh, anthropomorphic like the human brain. Like. Um, um, but it's not just no novel insights in life sciences. <laughs> So essentially, any, any, I mean, and they use this application in fraud detection and all sorts of different things. Um, essentially, the, the, more, the larger and more complex the data set, the better. I don't know if anybody here is a fan of basketball or anything like that, but uh, they, somebody made a network out of all of the Division I teams in the NCAAs this a couple of years ago. Um, if you remember Duke and UNC, this is the year that, uh, so Duke and UNC, they're in the ACC. They're very similar teams. They shoot three-pointers, they run, they run, they, they, they work on a running game, they have a big, they usually have three-point shooters and a big man in the center. They end up very same. Kentucky's on that same sort of thing. VCU, this is the year they were doing the full court press, trying to steal the ball, trying to, you know, really, really get you know, lots of activity. They're up there on the similar side. Stanford, oh, it's, and by the way, it's colored, the red color is the most wins, and blue color is the fewest wins. This is the year that Stanford was terrible. <laughs> They're not like any of the good teams, essentially. <laughs> So you see the good teams on the periphery, and then Stanford's in the middle, and they're just not any good this year. And that's because they're nothing like any of the other teams. 
Um, and, but UConn and Butler, so you can see Duke, UNC, Kentucky, VCU, they're on, this, they're, on, they're on their own feature, whereas UConn and Butler are in their own feature. So UConn and Butler played for the national championship that year. And it was, so these are high-scoring teams, three-pointers, big men. These are defensive-focused teams, and they played the lowest-scoring championship game in 60 years. So you can see that you can plug almost any data set in there and come up with useful visualizations. Um, it might be interesting, I don't know if it's actually feasible or not, to, to try and see, like, for, to try and use these networks to, like, to look for similar, sort of similar, uh, it's like similar play styles, perhaps. And if you were trying to say, well, is, Duke, is UNC going to win their first round game in March Madness and look for their opponent in the network and see how UNC is done against similar opponents in the network? And then, well, there's like that billion dollar challenge that Warren Buffett has. So if you win a billion dollars, I want some of it. It may be better than picking based on team uniform color anyways, or seeing which one your cat liked. My wife wants to try that. Um, and so this is another interesting network. So this is another basketball network. And the person who made the network ended up in the Forbes magazine 30 under 30 for sports between like Deron Williams and Kevin Durant. He was a Stanford medical student who essentially made this network during a summer internship and you know how, like, in traditional basketball, there's, like, five positions. There's the point guard, shooting guard, center, power forward, small forward, you know. And essentially what he decided was that uh, instead of being five main types, there were, like, 13 types of different basketball players based on whether they were, you know, under the basket and rebounding all the time or whether they were, you know, outside the three-point line and shooting all the time or whether they were distributing the ball or whether they were riding the bench, as they say, the role players. <laughs> so, you know, because you, you can think about it, there's power forwards in the, in the NBA who are very different from each other, like Dirk Nowitzki shoots three-pointers, he's out there all up by the three-point line, he doesn't bang around. Then you have Amari Stoudemire or LaMarcus Aldridge. Well, Aldridge has kind of a mid-range game, whereas Amari Stoudemire is always under the basket, but they're all technically power forwards. So, just by making, essentially by making this network and publicizing it in some fashion, he ended up in Forbes 30 out of 30, and uh, it's, it's sort of like the future of NBA, like you know, sort of money ball, except applied to the NBA by using sort of similarity features to dis describe your, because you can, you can use these to describe your teams. So this is like the, this is like the Celtics in 2011. You have, this is actually before Rajon Rondo was an all-star point guard. He was a role player on the bench. <laughs> they have Nate Robinson and you know, Kevin, I don't know, how, they had Shaquille O'Neal at one point. That, that surprised me. You know, and then the team changed the next year. And you could, you, could, you could see how as a, maybe as a general manager in baseball, or basketball, or baseball, or whatever it is, that you can sort of model your team you know, and in the distribution of how patient players are similar and, and maybe get some sort of insight if you had you know, some sort of a model. <laughs> um, yeah, so. I, I, I think they were second or third in the East these years. They were, they were a pretty good team. Uh, this is another slide, a sort of example of how different data things form shapes. This is, a, this is voting patterns in the United States Congress, 2009, which you'll see in a set. So the Republicans obviously are there in red and the Democrats are in blue, even though the, the, mar the little thing is switched. But in 2009, it's really interesting. They are basically, the voting patterns were essentially very similar through the majority of the Democratic Party. There's a couple little fragments and a couple singletons who don't match anybody else. And then there's you know, two, two branches of the Republican Party who kind of clung together in their minority. In 2010, it's totally different. <laughs> and so, I, I, you know, so Obama was elected in 2008, started in 2009. There was some, you know, there was, they still had a, a majority in Congress, I guess, the Democrats did. But 2010, I guess that's the midterm elections, right? So it's a very different voting environment for the folks in Congress. And so maybe that's the difference between, like, you know, Democrats pushing through policy versus, you know, the survival. I need to survive to get, get re-election. So maybe that's what fragmented everything. So, and then 2011, you see the... Republicans are kind of in control, but it's not an election year. It's not a midterm year. So everybody kind of coalesced back. I'm not sure. I only have three years of this data from this, this particular author's little experiment. But it's interesting to see how it totally fragmented for the election year. And then it kind of starts to coalesce back to some extent, even though it's still somewhat fragmented. So it's just really interesting to see how you can do different things with different data sets outside of the life sciences. So the out colors are independent. The, uh, these are yellow. So I mean, it's kind of interesting. You're seeing a blue, sort of some blues who voted with Republicans a bunch of times. I don't know if that was like you know, you know, blue dog Democrats, whether those moderates, or maybe they're from certain states trying to look a certain way, or maybe they're voting against Obamacare. I don't know. But yeah, the, the, the orange ones are, are, are independents. So they're off in their own little thing. <laughs>
Um, going back to the life sciences, uh, sort of as I was talking about earlier with the brain networks, you can sort of make these sort of fascinating networks um, with specifically large volume complex data sets. And one of, the, one of the things that MD Anderson has recently started doing, as long as a couple other people, is they're trying to put in these genomic data sets to try and look for insights for drug targets and, sort of, and that sort of thing. Um, one of the emerging, uh, so these are breast cancer patients from two different microarray data sets. There's the NKI and sort of a GE's, G, NKI data set, I think it's from the Dutch and GSE 2034. The NKI data set has outcomes of survive versus death and the GSE is no relapse versus relapse. And even though these are two, to, two totally different data sets of different patients, um, using, the same sort of, using the same sort of filter functions on both data sets, you sort of end up with the same shape and the same distribution of the uh, same associations in data, which is kind of interesting. And it's kind of, it's kind of a good way to sort of verify the internal validity of the tool. If you put two data sets of patients, patients who should be somewhat similar, and you run them through the same filter functions, you, you get outputs that are somewhat similar. And so the same thing happens. But uh, so what's interesting about this one, so it's uh, basically it's high ESR, which is the estrogen receptor, versus low ESR, and looking at relapse versus survival in both of these. Um, and what's kind of interesting is you have you know, some, some high ESR that survived and some high ESR that didn't do well. And then you have some clusters of low ESR on both sides that, that did and didn't do well. And then over on the other side is the sort of the, is, uh, chemokine levels. And it's the KEGG chemokine, which you know, I'm not an oncologist, so I don't know the specific significance of that. But essentially the ones, essentially in the patients who have low ESR1 levels, they all generally had a little bit more KEG chemokine levels, but the one, they're much higher in the survivors versus the folks who didn't do well. So ESR1 negative and lower chemokine levels was a poorer prognosis, and ESR1 negative and high chemokine levels was positive for the prognosis. And so KEG, so you could, you could so, when, so identifying just this difference in genomic expression between survival and death populations in certain, and, and, just the, and just a specific segment of that population might end up leading to some sort of insight in sort of how to target certain, a, certain, a certain part of a pop, certain subgroup of you know, cancers that didn't respond well to conventional therapies or explains why a certain subgroup doesn't respond well to conventional therapies. So even, even though this doesn't necessarily tell you what to do, it could at least hypothetically inform a trial of, you know, if you saw somebody who had low ESR1 levels and low chemokine levels, maybe you wouldn't start with your typical therapies because they, they already know that those patients are going to relapse or die. Maybe you go straight to your second or third line therapy. Um, another exploratory analysis, this is also cancer. Um, this is a map based on RNA expression from two different types of tumors. So it's ovarian cancer on top and breast cancer on the bottom. Um, and you can, and it, it's, it's ovarian cancer on the top and ovarian cancer on the bottom, essentially because those tumors, when you put them all in a database together, they are most alike. The, you know, the ovarian cancers are most alike each other, and the breast cancers are most alike each other. But in the middle are the cancers that are the most that share the most genetic material between the both, both this, between each of them. And so, if you look at progesterone levels in this one, this is pr the PGR receptor. That's almost universally on just the ovarian, the breast cancers. The ERBB2, which is the target of Herceptin. That's also almost universally on breast cancers. The estrogen receptors on both ovarian and breast cancers, but essentially what you can see is you know there's a little bit on a little bit of ovarian, a little bit of the, each each of these different ones highlights the, the ed, highlights the edges. So it highlights the ovarian cancers and it highlights the breast cancers. But this region in the middle where the cancers are kind of overlapping, what these turn out to be is the triple negative breast cancers. They don't express any of these. They don't express progesterone. They don't express estrogen. And they don't express uh, the the protein targeted by Herceptin. And so as it turns out, the, the, so essentially the breast cancers that are most like ovarian cancers are the triple negative breast cancers. And what they do express is mostly P53, which anybody who's been to medical school remembers P53 is the tumor suppressor gene. It's basically behind, it's one, it's one of the major uh, genetic mutations that's behind a lot of the cancer, cancers we see, um, which is not surprising. Um, Looking at it, just going through all the different genes, this author found that PSAT1 genes, there was a little bit of expression in those triple negatives, um, and Fox, FOXA1 not so much, but this PSA1 that's expressed in ovarian cancer and the triple negative breast cancers, that's also common to, that's actually an, an enzymatic product that's also expressed in ca uh, colon cancer, 
and the theory is, well, maybe this, maybe this, since it's an enzymatic process, can be, it can be, tar it, and it creates a protein. Anything that creates a protein can be a theoretical drug target. And so the author is like, well, I did this little exploration, and, and well, maybe PSA1 would be a, a potential drug target for patients who have triple negative breast cancer. You know, the, this is, you know, a couple, you know, published mid last year or something like that. So I don't know if that's actually going to go through or whether it's going to be in form a clinical trial. But that was the author's idea. Is like, okay, well, maybe, maybe this is an option. Um, so now that you have, I guess, now that I've showed you what other people have done, because a lot of their work is a lot more finished and pretty, I'll talk a little bit about what, what I've done. Um, and essentially what I've done is just gone around and loaded all the different data sets that I put into it and had access to. Um, this first one is a representation from our stroke thrombolytics registry. Um, if you know much about stroke and emergency medicine, there's this big push from the American Heart Association to use the clot-busting drugs, TPA and stuff like that, um, Genentech's behind this, and the American Heart Association, and so on and so forth. But one of the problems with the clot-busting drugs is that they also cause bleeding. They cause either a stroke that wouldn't, they it cause ischemic strokes to turn into hemorrhagic strokes, and when you use a clot-busting drug, it just keeps bleeding and bleeding and bleeding, and when it bleeds nonstop in your brain, that's a bad thing. Um, so initially I was doing research to see if doing coronary, uh, doing cerebral angiography before giving the clot busting was affecting the activity of the clot busting uh, you know, molecule and seeing if the blood vein barrier was being damaged by the you know, iodinated contrast and seeing if there would be increased intracranial hemorrhage because they were doing the angiography beforehand, you know, angiography to verify there was a clot before giving the dangerous medication. Uh, it turned out I didn't find anything. There was no difference between the two groups in my little sample. But I took that data set and I threw it in here, and this is colored in stroke severity. So essentially it made this interesting sort of, it made a loop essentially out of stroke severity where the mildest strokes are all over there, and there's sort of two branches of similarity, and then they merge over here with the most severe strokes. And when I look at deaths, the mild strokes up in the sort of upper right-hand corner, almost none of them have, or almost none of them die. But the patients who actually, who end up dying are, sort of fell into these three different clusters. And if I select the nodes in those clusters and look at you know, what's different about those three different clusters of you know, deaths compared to the rest of the background population, it turned into sort of three really distinct groups, at least in our thousand patients that we had in this registry. You had like the very elderly who had a bunch of medical problems before they had their strokes. And they didn't have any bleeding in their brain as a complication of the, of the drug. But they were so sick at baseline, and they had such a bad, and they had sort of a moderate stroke, but they were so sick at baseline, they died within seven days just because of it. So, I don't, I don't, this I don't have data on whether like DNR beforehand or anything like that. But that turned into one specific group of deaths. Another one was if they were old but not super old, but they had tremendously profoundly disabling strokes and they had bleeding in their brains, they also died within seven days, which makes a lot of sense. But what was interesting was there was actually a young group, a group with some people who were in their 30s in it, that also died, and they died because they had really severe strokes, and then they had massive bleeding. This is, so symptomatic hemorrhage just meant they had a little bit of bleeding, and they got worse. The parenchymal hemorrhage after legs means that like, it's space-occupying. So they, these people were clearly harmed by the medication. And what's, the, the theory is, you know, their stroke, stroke patients are so different. Um, the di types of different strokes are so different. The medication has a sort of a marginal safety value, but it's recommended as a blanket statement to give to everybody. So if you do a sort of retrospective analysis like this, and you find these clusters and profiles of distinct patients, you could, in theory, design a future trial where you, you, where you actually take these specific groups of patients and, see, and, and prospectively see if they actually have, the, see if, prospectively to sort of evaluate the risk-benefit ratio instead of, so that you can modify sort of the blanket statement to exclude groups specifically like this. I mean, a lot of these patients, they're so profoundly disabled, they might die whether they get the medicine or not. You just don't know that. Uh -huh. These are all ischemic strokes. None of these, these aren't AVMs. If you treat an AVM with thrombolytics, there's gonna be trouble. <clears throat> but you should see an AVM on the first non-contrast head CT. So if you start with bleeding, and you, 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 that's when you stop the process altogether. So if you, these are all people who had negative scans initially for bleeding. They thought it was an ischemic stroke. They turned out to have strokes. They had you know, mostly terrible strokes before, and then some of them died because of the strokes, and some of them died because of the complications of the medication. And it'd be nice to separate out specifically what little subgroups in our population would do are, are being would, are harmed by the medication versus being helped by the medication. 
and we just don't have that data yet. So it's it's kind of an, it's kind of this is like this is where this is where hypotheses start. Essentially, it's a hypothesis generation when you look at these kind of data sets. Um, another application I've been exploring is I'm sure you can really read this, <laughs> but this is this is essentially an example of like what you can put in put directly into Iris to sort of analyze. Um, this is sort of this is from our medication safety database. This is just these are you know. Financial numbers, alert date time, whether the alert medication alert was overridden or not, what the nurse said, whether they're going to monitor the patient or whether it wasn't clinically significant. And this is from a database of nurses who were overriding alerts for high potassium. So we have uh, these handheld barcode scanners. I'm sure you've, you probably hot, you're hot, possible probably use them too. You scan the patient, you scan the medication, and it looks for some sort of dis there's a decision support engine behind it that looks for pro look for problems. And this is a specific one that was looking to see if they were giving a potassium-containing medication to a patient who had a high potassium level, which is, uh, in some states, called lethal injection. Um, <laughs> and it's how they execute people. Um, so, of course, when we found out that this alert was being over 80% of the time <laughs> by the nurses, we're like, so we're lethally injecting all of our patients. Um, great. Um, so, of course, the Medication Safety Committee was tasked with figuring out why they were doing this, whether we should just fire all the nurses or whether there was a problem with the decision support. And, of course, you all probably know that it's a problem with the decision support because you're all, you've all, you, you all know clinical medicine and doc, nurse, nurses are generally doing the right thing and not trying to kill their patients. Um, so what happens is you, I load it into Iris and I highlight it based on the alert overrides. There's essentially a cluster and a feature over there where they all group together for the most part. And if you look, what's, look at what's, what's statistically different from that cluster to the rest of the background noise, is you find out that it's people with age of zero, which is people who are all less than one year of age in the system. It's all the people in the, the NICU, and it's all the children's hospital wards. So those are the patients that we're trying to kill. Um, so it turns out that, <laughs> and all the nurses are saying it's not clinically significant whenever they're overriding it. Um, and it turns out, you know, so in the NICU, the babies, they're hard to get blood out of. So what they do is they're heel sticking them. And as everybody knows in medicine, that the, when you heel stick somebody, it's traumatic to the blood cells, and they hemolyze. And when they break apart, they release their potassium into the bloodstream, and you have spurious elevation of potassium. So the potassium levels that they were using for the alert, uh, sort of the alert decision engine, were all wrong. And so they were getting these, so they were getting these alerts at the bedside. They knew the potassium level that the alert was based on was wrong, so they're just overriding it. And that's basically where all of our overrides are. There's a couple overrides you know, from the adult populations, but almost all the adults were being appropriately backed out whenever there was a hyper-K alert. It was only in the NICUs, only in the children's wards. So that's, so you can see that you've took, you know, it's a data set that's, you know, it's categorical and numerical and it's just, just it's crazy, it's, it's, you know, heterogeneous data. But you put it into the, it, it, this sort of, this technique, depending on the filter functions you use, can actually make a shape out of it that gives you some useful clinical insight. Um, this is my big project that I'm trying to work on. It's uh, another example of it's what I would what you call maybe a, pr a predictive application out of it. Um, so this is a big database of 43,000 children with mild traumatic brain injuries. Um, so it's like you know mostly well kids who have bonked their heads, they've fallen out of their cribs, or they've been in a car accident, but they look okay for the most part. Um, a very tiny percent of these patients, like one or two percent, actually have a serious intracranial injury. But we're trying to somehow get away with not, but the the because people are worried about lawsuits and missing things, they're scanning like 70% of these kids to find the 2%. Um, so that's not good. It's a lot of radiation. It's a lot of cost. Um, so these folks, they did a the big they did their their big uh, a big prospective study to gather a lot of information. They did a recursive partitioning analysis, and they came up with a decision rule that basically catches. It's like 99% sensitive, but it's only about it's only right about half the time. It's like 50% specific. So I ran their database through it, and unfortunately, it's really hard for you to read, so I'll read it for you, because it's formatted, and it's just, it's just too wide format for the screen. But basically, it kind of falls into five distinct profiles. My theory was, or my hypothesis is, that if you can, rather than take the, you know, the six elements of recur recursing partition analysis and make a sort of a blanket statement that gives you, that only classifies half your population, and you don't have any, you sort of have a, a not low risk population that's the other half, that if you take the, if you can group the patients based on sort of a similarity and associative measures and then take new patients and then plug them into the database, the, the data set essentially, and look at where they fall within, you know, what their associations and what clusters they would fall into, then you might be able to sort of spit out a better predictive sort of decision support uh, piece of information. 
And so you can see it's sort of five different clusters. This one is spinal injuries, neurologic deficits, and seizures. So if you, that was one major cluster of kids who actually had something bad going on inside their brain. Then we had kids who came in, multiple episodes of vomiting, they got knocked out, and it looked like their skull was broken. You know, so, so either uh, bruising under their eyes or blood coming out their ears. Okay. I mean, maybe that was obvious before, <laughs> before, that they, before we made this network. Um, vomiting, headaches, and just a bruise, the specific location of bruise on their head, and they couldn't remember the event. That was like another group of patients that sort of all clustered together. They all had sim this, this sort of constellation of injuries all occurred together in a sort of a region of high incidence of, of uh, intracranial hemorrhage. Um, patients who had really bad headaches and also lost consciousness. They had a little, there's a little group of patients there. I probably should have pulled out that one too. I don't have that one. Um, and this one is patients who had moderate headaches but had a lot of other obvious trauma to their head and, ne and necks. There was you know, obvious other external trauma that sort of, sort of mechanism of inju injury sort of context to, sh to suggest that there might be something else bad going inside their head and they couldn't remember the event. So. Uh, so what I did, and so I have to help me with this part, is I made another network to use to sort of make network membership predict to try and to try and see if network membership could be used to predict, you know, the ultimate outcomes. Because it's really complicated to do this with like the sort of heterogeneous network that I had, where there's like a lot of different little clusters everywhere. I sort of I used a couple of different filter functions that came with the network that clusters all of the head injuries into one sort of portion of the network. And it's almost none of the Henry's showed up in the other parts of the network. And so what we did is we used this group as our sort of group membership thing. And oh, so I should mention this is only two thirds of the database. I used the other the other one, so I used two thirds to make this network, and the other one third is held out as our test set. And so what we did is we added each individual patient from the test set to this two thirds and and saw and and recorded where it fell into the network. And it was a positive finding if it ended up in this section, and a negative finding if it ended up in that section. And what happens is it's about 95% sensitive and about 60% specific based on if you use group membership to predict ultimate outcome, which is essentially, as far as area under the curve goes, that's, it's not, this isn't usable in clinical practice because you're still only 95% sensitive, but as far as the area under the curve goes, it's identical to, the, to what PCARN came up with. And that's with a pretty, that's, a, that's not a really good predictive network just based on your, you know, sort of looking at it. Like, you know, it had a lot of gray in it. It was, you know, just one... It, it, you, you saw that I had five heterogeneous profiles of people, so putting them all in one group means it's you, you, you're sort of defeating the purpose of separating all those heterogeneous groups out. But it was sort of a proof of concept you can use group membership to predict outcomes. Because I didn't use a very, like I because like I showed you in this network, they're really different from each other. Right. So they're all the different types of head injured patients who had intracranial injury are different from each other. And then if you clump them all in one feature of the network, you're not really separating them, teasing out the different groups. Um, yes, right. So that's what I'm hoping to find out. That's my, that's act, that is the active area of research I am trying to do. What I'd like to do, essentially, in conceptually, I'm not going to use IRA, as the IRS to do it because plugging it in and processing through this is not that, it's, I mean, this is a proof of concept, essentially, a proof that it's heterogeneous and stuff like that. But the, the concept would be, I have a patient, like you're talking about, it comes in, they, have a, they don't have skull fracture, but you said they seized on scene and they can't remember whether they, can't remember the accident. They might fall here. You know, and you could say, I'm going to look at all, like, the, the, the 200 closest patients in this network, and what was their instance of severe head injury? And it'll spit out, and you could say, well, three of those patients had a head injury, or maybe it was 12. Maybe it was 12 patients out of the group head injury. Then you can go back to your, pa your parents and say, you know, I've compared this kid to, like, you know, 500 other kids who had an injury similar to yours, an injury pattern, a seizure, and who lost consciousness, and they had a 2% chance of having something really bad going on in their brain. Do you want me to watch them for a few hours? Do you want to scan them right now? Or do you want to take them home and watch them yourself? So that's the kind of information I want to bring to, pay, because that's, that's, a, that's a shared decision-making thing that we need to be doing in medicine, but we don't have the tools for it. You know, I, make the, I do this thing, hey, you do this every day. We do this every day in medicine. We make a whole bunch of decisions for patients, and we don't really, we want to be able to involve them in decision. We want to share with them the risks and the benefits and the alternatives. But we don't have good information, good decision support that has that sort of granular patient level data.
So that's what I'm trying to do. Well, this is, and this is my proof of concept that I want to sort of turn into a, a sort of a, my, my, a sort of a decision engine to try and see if it works. Yeah. Okay. Has it been applied to meta-analysis that you know of, or meta-analysis studies, in particular like ones that come out where you have one time, say a Cochrane review comes out, says, yeah, we support this treatment. And then the next time another cock review comes out, you know what, never mind, we don't support it anymore. What do you mean by applied? Uh-huh. Analysis. So the problem with, so meta-analyses, it depends on how they're doing it. Um, the Cochrane reviews usually just take the outcomes from the studies and then weight them. They are not true patient level meta-analyses. They're not taking the patient level data and running them where you, can't, where you can make a, some sort of a patient level network. They're really just weighting the outcomes for different studies. They're not, this, they're not, they're not taking the patient level data and pooling it. Um, you have to have cooperation and buy-in from all the different trial authors to pool their data. And a lot of times the, data, the pe people aren't gathering the same individual data points and the same baseline characteristics. So you just have to, as part of your meta-analysis, meta decide you know, what the flaws are, which ones you're going to exclude, and which ones you're going to include based on their methods and which things they recorded. But they, most of most meta-analyses, especially the Cochrane review stuff, they're just weighting the outcomes. They, this wouldn't be applicable to what they're doing unless, like the future. So there's something called the all trials thing and the open data initiatives in Europe. So there's, there's supposed to be the point where the new drug makers and all the stuff, all the clinical trial data is supposed to be in this open repository. I think Yale is doing, coordinating the group with, in concert with, and Johnson & Johnson is partnering with Yale to start with. There's a group at Yale that's going to be managing the open data for at least some part of what's happening in the U.S., and I'm not sure who's going to be doing it in Europe. But we are moving towards a point where we're going to start getting more and more access to patient-level data from clinical trials, and so we can start looking at the data and looking at, you know, looking at the heterogeneity of the data, not just looking at whatever outcome the clinical trial told us to do. And so I'm hoping that, you know, in the future we're going to be able to not just play with it like this, but also build it into the back end of some of our decision support tools and decide who on Divigatran really needs to be on Divigatran as opposed to, you know, based on their renal function and their risks and everything else is going on versus, you know, putting everybody on Divigatran because, you know, Warfarin's 60 years old or 70 years old. Um, last one, another piece of work in progress since we're running out of time. Uh, one of our, one of my co-faculty uh, co is working on emergency department forecasting and uh, sort of flow modeling in the emergency department, looking for resource utilization and, you know, surge, surge capability and stuff like that. So this is actually a, uh, a network I was able to make out of the length of stay of all the patients in our emergency department for the last year. So anything in red is over six hours. So I'm sure you're cringing because you know that six hours is an eternity in emergency medicine and there's going to be no hospital that's keeping people in the emergency department that long. But when you get into academic medical centers, you run into all these constraints and con consultants and boarding and all sorts of things. So we actually have a lot of patients over six hours. So we're trying to figure out, well, first of all, who is over six hours? And once we can figure out and model who's going to be over six hours, then we can sort of start predicting what sort of resources we need to mobilize if these sort of patients before it happens. Um, so it's, uh, like I said, these are sort of just in progress work. Um, this one is the patients who got admitted. <laughs> so you can see we have a lot of patients who are only, us, uh, only it, it doesn't, re doesn't necessarily overlap specifically the patients who got, who were here for six hours. So that's kind of, we kind of thought, well, in, you know, intuitively, the patients who are admitted, they're the ones that are going to be staying here the longest. They'll be waiting for their bed upstairs. But it turns out that's actually not, that's not the case anymore. Because a lot, what happens is a lot of patients get the same sort of, same amount of care and the same tests in the emergency department as the patients who get admitted. We have lots of patients come in and they get a CT or an ultrasound, and that, you know, that's four or five hours in length of stay based on whatever the volume is in the emergency department. And, and at the end, then there's a decision made. And so there's... The admitted patients, obviously, you know, some, some get quick dispositions, some get slow dispositions, but we found that, that being admitted to the hospital had no real association with uh, how long your length of stay was, which is interesting because there are other types of patients. There are psychiatric patients waiting for transfer to psychiatric facilities, and there's patients who wait in the ER because the, the bed is full. And, and, so, and it doesn't, this also takes into account waiting room time. So some of the patients who waited for six hours and got discharged spent a lot of that time in the waiting room as well. Um, this is patients who arrive by ambulance. It does have a big overlap with the patients who get admitted, which is, yeah, it makes a little bit of sense. Although there's, there's some people who have used the ambulance service as a taxi service, but you know, to some extent that actually, that does vary, that, that this, this fits in intuitively with the distribution of, uh, of patients arriving by ambulance versus 
versus being admitted. And the patients who arrive by ambulance, maybe they're the sickest. They kind of tend to be at the fringes where the six hour, you know, the longer lengths of stay were. So maybe they had more evaluations in the emergency department. Um, these are our walk-ins. They probably spent most of their time waiting in the waiting room and you know, essentially none of them got admitted. Or very, very few of them get admitted if they walked in. So that was kind of an interesting insight. Um, and then of course, because we are the second oldest ambulance helicopter service and one of the busiest trauma centers, one of two trauma centers in the nation's fourth largest uh, city, this is, uh, this is our arrivals by helicopter, which is actually a significant portion of our arrivals. They don't necessarily spend six hours or more in the emergency department, which is kind of interesting. So they don't wait in the waiting room, which is number one. <laughs> if, you arrive by, if you arrive by ambulance, sometimes they will put you back in the waiting room. Because if you're, you're obviously not sick, using it as a taxi service. If you ride by helicopter, you will not. They have never done that. <laughs> They've never put you back in the waiting room after you arrive by helicopter. And that it makes sense. Mostly it's trauma patients. Mostly it's, uh, and we have some strokes that we fly in as well from the rural areas to try and be under the time windows for stroke. Um, but you also notice that it doesn't just overlap the admitted patients either. We actually have a fair number of patients who come in because the life light is activated based on the mechanism of injury because they see this car that's totally mangled and the person's trapped in the car and so on and so forth. So they call the helicopter, the helicopter comes, and you know, at the end of the day, they get a splint and some stitches, <laughs> and they go home. So it's actually interesting to see that our ambulance arrivals don't necessarily overlap with our admitted patients, and, kind of, and that they don't actually spend that six hours, because they get evaluated immediately, treat, treated immediately, and then whatever their disposition ends up being. So this is, this is like, like I said, it's work in progress. It's just kind of fun to, fun to put your data in there to see what happens. Um, and so, so yeah, like I said, we're just trying to explore this data and see what we can come up with. And uh, that just about wraps it up, and I'm pretty sure I'm hit up against my time. So if you have any questions or want to see anything else or just chat with me, I can, I'm not for it, whatever. Hit your button. Don't forget to hit your button. <laughs> Thank you. I have two questions. Sure. The first question is, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that the shape of the output indicates some fact about this, the nature of the data. Uh -huh. um, but then I became concerned when you said in the brain example that you can make it look mm -hmm. however you want. Uh -huh. So can you please talk about um, what displays, how the display can be changed by the user and then what kind of checks and balances are built into the program to preserve the integrity of that data? I don't think there are any specific checks and balances built into this program to do that. The, so you could, you could, so like the brain example, even though they were able to make a two-dimensional projection that in Euclidean space appeared to be like the brain, you, don't necess you could have laid that out in two-dimensional space in any fashion, and the same things would have still highlighted and been associated with each other, and they would have still overlapped in the visualization that you make. Um, I think that person tried specifically to make a projection in two-dimensional space, and or maybe, the, or it could just be that the network, you know, the, the cells in the the cells in the brain that express the same levels of protein that are connected to the other cells that express the same levels of protein, and so on and so forth. It, I didn't, I don't have access to that. I don't really know how they did it. it maybe it does tend to break a brain, and it's just, a, just that's just the way when you run it through uh, whatever filter it is without any sort of nefarious, you know, nefarious in, intervention. The, the way it connects nodes to similar nodes, it ends up actually mimicking the shape of the brain because that's actually how the brain is connected to each other. But that's a good, that's a good question. I, I don't have a great necessary answer for that. The other question I have yeah, yeah. is, is there any kind of um, like systematic way of interpreting these? Because it seems like so abstract in a mm -hmm. way that it could be subject to who's looking at it. Yeah. So it's, it's essentially, it's, it's an exploratory data analysis looking for sort of associations to as hypothesis generation. Um, so it, everything you see in here may be red herrings and it, it is it essentially it is operator dependent. It's not like a, it's not a straightforward statistical analysis that's defined by a certain statistical significant cutoff. It's, these things seem to be associated with each other through this specific filter of similarity and then you have to sort of, you have to use, a, there's a level of expert interpretation that you say could either be absent or present, depending on who's looking at the data, and you could end up you know, looking at something that's totally useless, or you could end up looking at something that's actually really interesting and useful. So it is, a, it is definitely operator-dependent and subjective. And so um, 
can you explain more about what type of filter it is and also how different filters will affect the results? Um, so different, so the, the, like the, the data starting, what kind of data set can you feed into the system? Is that what you asked? Mm -hmm. Sure. So you can use any data that you can put in a tab delimited text file, essentially. So it can be, and it can be any data type. It can be, you know, decimal, numerical, ordinal, categorical, whatever you want, it to, whatever kind of data type. And the software knows that people are going to be putting different kinds of data type and it does a sort of a normalization of each different data type and evaluates each, each different column set individually to, to figure out what kind of data type it is and whether it needs to be projected, whether it needs to be normalized or, whether, or how it needs to be treated sort of in the back end. The filter functions, like I said, they're essentially, there's a, you can use any kind of mathematical function as your filter. The ones that tend to be most useful are the same ones that you would use in clustering measures of local density or measures of, how, of centrality. Um, or measures of variance from the mean. So measuring you know, how, how different, me measuring how different it is from, it, 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 me either measuring how it's, you know, how, how, it, uh, how closely defined it is to things in local space or measuring how closely defined it is to the center of the data set. Those tend to be the sort of the mathematical filter functions that tend to be the most useful because, and it, it, makes, it's, it makes somewhat sense because those are the ones that are most useful in clustering. But I, like I said, I'm not a statistician. I, uh, that was not an adequate answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. You don't really have to answer this question, but do you know the method by which they determined the distance between two points? Because it seems like you toss a lot of data and huh? magic comes out. But I'm, yes, curi I'm curious um, about like like how they filter that data or how they decide which features. So they have actually, the there's process. multiple different options to do for your distance function. Built into the system, like for, they, they will do, you can do just straight up Euclidean distance. You can you can do a variance normalized Euclidean sort of distance. There's there's a bunch of di and there's like a Hamming distance, which is really good for like categorical ordinal or categorical or uh, dichotomous values. And um, so essentially, they have they have a bunch of different distance fit functions you can use built into the system, and they're based on either norm they're either normalized or non-normalized, and. To some extent, yes, you're, if, depending on what kind of data you put in there, different filter functions will give you vastly different results, and some may be more, more or less appropriate for your data. I'm just curious, like, if you toss all your data in there, does, does the system sort of select, like, okay, this is the feature we should prioritize over this in terms of... No, so it doesn't do any cluster. feature weighting, which is kind of interesting, and that's kind of where the, you have to be a little bit of an expert. And I kind of wish there was an opposite. Right now, all you can do is turn features on and off, so or tur turn columns on and off, essentially, when you do it running an analysis. So you can either like, uh, like in the basketball thing, I, also have, I, went, I was going to show you a basketball one that I did. But you can like turn off like free throws. Like I don't really care about free throw attempts. So if, or maybe you can turn off free throw percentage because it's not as useful as free throw attempts or something like that. Um, but I wish you could do some more weighting. It doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily weight different columns next to each other. But may, may, that might just be too expert level for what the audience that they designed the tool for. Just wondering about the edges between nodes. Uh -huh. Are they? Uh, is there any relevance to um, your analysis or to the actual um, software implementation of the number of common uh, points in both of the nodes? Is there a different edge weight depending on whether uh, two nodes have one point in common or several points in common? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know about that. I don't think that there is any special weighting to the edges, although that would be very interesting to see. I don't, I, uh, I, so you can, there's a, a gain function that lets you decide how many nodes a point can be a member of, and that's one way to get, you know, very, you know, if the data looks like it's kind of sparse and, and not associated with that, you can turn up the gain <laughs> and it turns into an, a, 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 it links it better so you can see some of the associations a little bit better. But I don't know if there's any weighting specifically in the edges or any information specifically encoded in the edges based on the number of patients in, you know, if in both, no, both nodes have a bunch, like you said, a bunch of features in common, whether that edge is weighted any differently. I could ask them. Yeah. Yeah. All right, no thanks.